welcome back. Welcome, 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 welcome. I know some of you are like, what? The name has changed and it has for a lot of reasons. And what a better show, what a better show we have in store for you around Mission Accepted. Uh, mission Accepted, so what is that? So that is what you do. That is what you do when you are an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur or you're breaking your way as a creative or you're in media. You accept the mission. And I know that you guys have come on to hear yet another inspiring story about what it was like to do that. And not only what is it like to accept the mission, but why the heck do we stay? <laughs> because it's not just one mission. It doesn't come across your desk once. It actually comes across multiple times. And the more you're in it, the more missions that you take. And honestly, the more fun it gets too. So we bring in unbelievable guests that share their mission so that you can take those gemstones and apply them to your life in whatever way, whether it's the mission of parenting, huh? we all know about that, or whether you as well have taken on about being an entrepreneur. So welcome to the show. We have an incredible guest with us and his name is Matt. And the reason why I was saying that this truly is going to be a mission accepted show is because he is the son of a pastor. And that in itself is its own mission. And how the heck, Matt, did you go from a son of a pastor to actually taking this on yourself and becoming an entrepreneur? Uh, a very zigzag path. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm honored and excited to be here. It'll be a fun conversation. Um, so I, I am the least likely entrepreneur ever. That's why I jokingly refer to myself because I had no plans to get into this. Uh, like you said, homeschooled pastor's kid, uh, and uh, introvert on top of it and a musician. So I picked up the drums when I was, uh, still in diapers and then picked up other things along the way, like piano and bass and stuff. And so I've always played, always had instruments around, but I always figured I'd be in some sort of like mission work. And uh, circle around to uh, 20s, started a real estate business uh, with the impeccable timing of starting it in 06, uh, got out in 07 and uh, <laughs> said, okay, well, there was things that I liked and things that I didn't like. And I, I, I realized later that the things that I liked about it were like marketing and team building slash leadership. And that all came back around because I got into an agency in my mid thirties that took advantage of all that stuff. Uh, a lot of their clients were top, top real estate agents. So it all kind of came full circle in all of those skills that I picked up over the years of bouncing from one thing to another, kind of looking for what I was going to do, all, all came together in one position. Uh, it also worked well because I spent about five years chasing the dream as a musician. And in that time, I built up things like, okay, how do you build a WordPress site? And I started doing a little bit of marketing work for a piano studio. And, you know, all of a sudden I'm doing like this freelance marketing stuff. Uh, and so I parlayed that at a, job, at a job into an agency, right? So just working for somebody else, making 35K a year. And I uh, got the opportunity to go out on my own and I grabbed it and I never looked back and ended up starting a podcast production agency. Everything just kind of was one relationship to another that led to those things and how I got pulled into it. But the, uh, the, the end result is that I have an amazing business that supports kind of a life of creativity. I'm able to work on music again. I don't need to make any money off of the music. So it's only about the impact that I make. Um, I've got the business down to our only work in the mornings. I don't schedule appointments or meetings in the afternoon. Um, Mondays, I basically don't have appointments at all. Uh, so it's, it, I've got it really systematized and, and streamlined so that I only work on it in the times when I'm freshest and my best. And then I can work on music later in the afternoon and into the evening. So I have exactly what I uh, set out to build, which is a business that supports the the creativity that I still want to have, but it doesn't require me to make a living off of my art, which takes a lot of the pressure off. So anyway, that's the story. That's an incredible story. And I can hear, it's like I always say, I can hear my audience and they're like, how, how, how? But I want to go back to the moment where you accepted the mission. I want to go back to where you're making $35,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for some people, that's great. For some people, that's not satisfactory and everything in between. And what what made you decide to go in the direction? The opportunity uh, appeared, as many of us have, many opportunities and even more so. So what was the pivotal decision about? What was the moment about? If you could go back there and go, what made me decide to do that? I can pinpoint it. I haven't thought about this in a while. Um, I, was, I, I was sitting on... I think I was sitting like on the beach in, in Pacific beach here in San Diego with the CEO of the company I was working for. And I was working for him directly in the office and we had struck up a friendship and he just turns and looks at me and he's like, you will, you know why you'll never be as good at marketing as I am. 
And I'm like, well, gee, tell me, tell me why. Okay. It's like, because you're not playing with your own money. And I'm like, okay, tell me more. And he just said, look, man, you can, you can work for me. He's like, you can play with my money and you'll get good. He's like, you'll never get great unless you go out and you do your own thing and it's your own money and your own life online and you have to make it work. He's like, if I were you, I would make it my, he didn't put it this way, but he said, basically make it your mission to become a professional in this thing that you're doing. Call it, call it marketing, call it whatever, but you know, become a professional. And that, that was the, that was kind of the crossroads. And I said, absolutely. Like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, this, this is, if I do it well, it'll support all the other things that I want to do. And, and he was so right. I mean, he was so right at every level. Like I did not get good at it until I was out of it and out on my own and had to figure stuff out. But yeah, that was kind of the moment where I'm like, yes, this is, this is the mission and I accept the mission. That's, you know, that's incredible. And I think it's important to know because we all kind of have those pivotal scream louder than not moments, right? And sometimes someone else is inviting, sometimes someone's pushing us out of the nest, sometimes it's a phone call. And I think it's important uh, to remind people that it's not, um, you know, it doesn't come with all of the, you know, it doesn't come with the kit and the batteries included. Sometimes you just get the model, then you got to go buy the glue and then you got to go buy the batteries or whatever it is. And, but it's that sense of knowingness and, um, you know, congratulations for the gentleman that actually shared that with you, because, you know, knowing you that I know now, if you worked for me, I, I'd want you to, stay. <laughs> I'd want you to stay. It's How, really hard. Yes. Yeah, yeah, when you yeah, have yes. somebody good. Yeah. Like now that I'm in that position, yeah. I have a really hard time. When, when you have somebody that's a rock star, yeah, you like, you want to hang on to them. It's, it's hard to kick them out of the nest when you know they should go. Yeah, that's amazing. So um, it's those moments. It reminds me what your story reminds me of a story before I got into the music industry. And then I got from music into entrepreneurship and, and uh, therefore, and I remember clear as day, like if someone was to ask me, I could pretty well, if I thought about it, tell you what I was wearing. It was this moment where I was standing and I thought, I wanted to go join the forces and I was 17 years old and there's no forces in my family. There's no military, there's no nothing. And I took the bus, which was a big deal back then to take the bus back then as if I'm, but you know, I'm not 20, uh, took the bus from where I lived into downtown Vancouver, which was a big deal. There was no sky train or anything else. And I stood outside the military office and I must've stood there for hours I might have been 17, 16, 17, 17. Had someone walked up and said, would you like me to open the door for you? I would have found the bravery to walk through, but I never did. I oh, turned around, got on my little bus and got back home and ended up going way more into the music industry. And then music t- took me to entrepreneurship. But um, how interesting, just how interesting how things turn out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is wild. Uh, I was expecting to, yeah, I was not ex- expecting that to go into a chapter of your life that I did not know at all. Like, I, you know, oh, I did four tours and, you know, came yeah, back. Yeah, and yeah, no. Crushed no, boot but, camp. Didn't go yeah. in the door. That's really interesting. Didn't, yeah, I didn't something go in like the door. that was the difference between you having a completely different path in life. Huh. Right. So I went back. Uh, someone turned me on to the music industry from, like, honestly, just like, hey, I think you should put a tray in your hand because I really like how you sound. Like, someone who owned a club was we were at a big event and I was talking about how this waitress should have done a better job with us that night. And he goes, why don't you show up tomorrow and I'll throw a tray in your hand. And I'm like, why don't you do that? Which took me to then to meeting bands, to this, to help. And it went down this whole love for music. And I was kind of showing off my picture of Gianna's job before we started. And then that lifestyle led me to, I think I want to find a different lifestyle that's a little bit healthier. And I went from that to health and wellness but I've always still in my heart, not that I want to go play in that arena, but if anyone from the military, you know, not that you're going to now call me, anyone from the military calls me and wants anything in. When I created a holistic health studio, the forces were allowed to come at a price that was like practically free. So anyway, something there, who knows? That's interesting. You know, I think there's, um, you know, what makes people really uncomfortable uh, about just that idea that, you know, one person could have opened that door and your life would have been completely different. Mm -hmm. It makes people really uncomfortable that we are, there's so much creativity in involved in how our lives turn out. And we're, it all comes down to 
decisions that we make and those decisions can be influenced by something as simple as somebody not opening a door and kind of giving us a push in a certain direction or nudging us off in a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, uh, I think we, we want to look at at things as if there's fate and there's things that are guiding us and those things can all be true to an extent but we're wildly uncomfortable with the fact that like we have a massive amount of creativity and freedom in our decision making and our lives can go in a lot of different directions and it's kind of up to us i mean to me that was freeing like i came from a very legalistic background of if you're not on the right path you're going to get blasted like bad things are going to happen to you and so i come that i have that in my background so for me to step out of that and get into this realm of creativity was actually very freeing for me. It makes other people very uncomfortable. They want, they want to feel like fate is behind them pushing in a certain direction. I don't believe that that's necessarily true. Uh, I think creativity, like the, we are human beings, we are in, in endowed with the ability to make our own choices. And we have the, the ability to choose a whole bunch of different types of lives that we can have. Um, it makes people uncomfortable, but to me, it's very liberating. You know, it's one of the best parts of being alive. I, I relate. I was talking to a woman yesterday and I recently been calling myself an entrepreneur or just a creative. Right. And I say, because it was, it makes people uncomfortable. Sometimes I always find myself saying, I know it's going to sound like I do a lot. You know, when I'm talking to people, you know, like I have to dance and, it's like, uh, and she said to me, so I said, oh, I've been calling myself an entrepreneur. It just kind of makes it easier for people to understand that I'm a little multifaceted. And she said, um, and so we were having this conversation and uh, she had come up with a word for herself as well, which was incredibly interesting, which described the same thing. And we were almost like thirsty for each other. We'd never met before. She literally bought a copper pot that I was selling because she likes to cook. And she bought this copper pot. And she goes, you know, you ended up giving me a great deal. And we ended up having a conversation. And uh, she's a philanthropite. She calls herself a philanthropite. I'm like, okay, okay. Okay, I'm going to have to um, explain anyways, that one to me. Yeah. What's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the back half of that pipe? Well, so she does these, she, she creates these companies that don't necessarily, um, like all of the, what I do is based around health and wellness and entrepreneurship and creating platforms for entrepreneurs and creating business. And, but my sector is health and wellness. Hers is variable, right? Mm -hmm. Marketing company, incredible, you know, uh, restaurant, Airbnb, um, real estate statistics. And so she has all of these businesses that she creates and uh, with the whole premise and the energy of a philanthropist, mm -hmm. where she can create things, create revenue, make impact, and move on. But uh, she does companies instead of donations. So, sure. yeah. So yeah, it's a new word, like I'm a, sure. Like a socialpreneur or something like social yeah. impact yeah. entrepreneur. Okay. That makes yeah. sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. All right. That's awesome. Oh, sorry about that. My camera went bleep there for those of you that are watching and not listening. But look, <laughs> um, so... Now that you know everything about me and Matt, let's talk about you guys out there. Okay, there's some, you've, you've created some interesting um, books that talk about some interesting things that I had never heard of before. I mean, I know the word micro and I know the word famous, but you know, when people get a, get, get a hold of this energy of the entrepreneurship, you know, it's like we, by nature, we're all in kind of people. Can you share this concept and this idea around being micro famous? Yes. And it's funny because I think it was heavily influenced by my background as a musician and watching how and why bands break out into the mainstream. So the idea of micro famous, like in, in the business world would be the equivalent of like me or, or clients of mine where they can go to the grocery store and nobody recognizes them. But when they set foot in the right conference or the right business event, they're like swamped and like people are asking them for pictures and autographs and they're clamoring for their advice. Like that, that's a big thing. And I, they don't just, they're not just fans, but they, they're like asking them really deep, interesting questions about entrepreneurship. And to me, that's the ideal for, for myself and for a lot of the people that I know. There are certain people in business that absolutely have an insatiable motor inside to be Tony Robbins famous and good for them. God bless you. Go do it. But there's a lot of other people that are like, I don't need that. I don't need to speak on every stage. I don't need to be speaking every weekend, God forbid, because I don't want to live in airports and hotel rooms. And I don't need to be on Oprah, you know, like I want, I want ideal clients. I want a great lifestyle. I want to hang out with my spouse or kids or whatever, you know, like I want to, I want a great life and I want to impact people. And the question is, well, how, like, how do you actually do that from a marketing perspective? Because if you're, if you're anybody that wants to make an impact, your natural inclination is to go for as many people as possible 
on the other side, everybody on the receiving end wants something that's super custom for them. So those two things are always in conflict with you. There's a tension there, right? Like we're always pulling to impact more people and expand who we serve. Everybody on the receiving end wants something that's super custom and personal for them as much as humanly possible. And when they want to, when they work with somebody, they want to know how many people just like me have you worked with? How many, where's the success stories? Where's the testimonials from people that look exactly like me? That's what they want. So those two, those two things are always intention. So micro famous means like in the context of business, you don't need millions of eyeballs on your content. You don't need to be Gary Vee. You don't need to be on social media 10 hours a day, right? You don't need millions of followers on Instagram. In fact, I know people that do and they still can't make it work. That like that doesn't bring success. So that's one of the things that breaks your brain when you start running into people that have millions of downloads and hundreds of thousands of followers and they're having to sell something to make their rent or they can't sell a product to save their life, you know, whatever. So I just, I just came to this conclusion that like most of the people in my world that I was really drawn to, that they, they care a lot about impact, but they also care about lifestyle. And so the ideal for them and for myself is to be micro famous. In other words, I can go to the grocery store, nobody knows who I am, but when I go to the right places full of my ideal people, they already know who I am because of something like a podcast that I host. And then the introduction is already made for me. You know, I can go in those networking rooms and as an introvert, I can mingle because I know there's going to be people I'm going to run into that knows somebody that I interviewed, or maybe they already know me. Maybe they've already heard of my podcast. It's really cool as an introvert to go to an event and stand in line at the Starbucks and the, and the, the hotel venue outside the event and be recognized in line at Starbucks. Like that's a, for an introvert, that's a great icebreaker. So when somebody goes, I think I know you, it's like, let's, let's figure it out. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's what micro famous uh, comes from. And like I said, it, I think it has to do with the musician part of me. Like I just watched, like I, I never had popular taste in music. All of my favorite bands were like Alice in Chains and Dream Theater and all these bands that were like super niche underground stuff. And, but they had rabid fan bases because they weren't the mainstream that everybody else listened to. Like that's what made those fan bases so crazy about them. And I see the same stuff happen in the business world. And I think we should just, if that's what you want, go out and build with that in mind, I guess, rather than building for the maximum number of eyeballs. I, you know, it's, it's very, it's ingenious in a way that it kind of alleviates a lot of pressure, even yeah. for the person who wants to have that fame. Um, like you said, the Tony Robbins fame or the Oprah fame. Um, it's, it's great because it shows that there's progression and kind of like where I was sitting at outside of the, you know, outside of the forces and I could have gone this path or this path. Um, <clears throat> To get to even a place of micro famous is a great place to make a decision whether you want to go further, right? Hundred percent, right? Because you're like, you can, and also recognizing where that that is a process for you, and for some people that's the goal. I think there's too much, and I think we could. I mean, honestly, we could all agree, but there's companies that you know make your numbers look bigger on social media, and there's numbers because of the perception and the perceived success that you have and then when we know that people are asking so how many people have you worked with and how many subscribers on your podcast and how many this and how many that it raises that angst I would say to be bigger to be out there um and what does that look like you know and what does that look like and does it yeah. financially serve you because it's just an automatic I have more customers I make more money but is that the truth? You know, <laughs> it's, it's definitely not the truth. Yeah. Yeah. That's you, you have to see it up close and that's what breaks mm. people's brains. Uh, what broke my brain the first time was seeing it on the inside from two different shows that I was hosting in the same space. I had different co-hosts on each one. And so each of those podcasts was aimed at a different part of the market. One was aimed at the mainstream and, and the beginners. The other was aimed at like the top, the affluent, the, the top 1% of the market. Obviously, the one that was aimed at the affluent top 1% got way fewer downloads and didn't make any of the top 10 lists and didn't get any of the accolades on social media and all this stuff. It also built a multi six figure coaching consulting business in like two years, bam, just like that. And so I was looking at that going, okay, I'm on the backside, I co host both of these podcasts. And, uh, you know, like, the one that was easier to monetize that the host of that wasn't even very active on social media and had a tiny email list, right? Just none of the advantages that the other show had, uh, but it was way easier to monetize. So that's what broke my brain the first time around was just seeing it for myself from the inside. And, and then the longer you go in, in my case, we tried a lot of different things to monetize that bigger 
show. And we finally found something that works. So we, we do make six figures a year off the back of that podcast now, six years later, right? It took us a while to get it. But in the meantime, we had a big audience and we tried a whole lot of different things. And you'd be surprised how frustrating it is to run a mainstream big numbers podcast that you have a hard time monetizing and getting people to buy stuff off of. It's not actually a very fun position to be in because you feel like you're the problem. Like, why aren't people buying from me? It's like, well, maybe the problem isn't you. Maybe it's the audience you built just aren't buyers and that's okay. And that's, that's what we built a lot on, on the back of that show. And so I, like I, because I've been down that road, when somebody comes to me and goes, oh, I want to, bam, big podcast, big numbers, all this stuff. I'm like, maybe, or <laughs> maybe you'll run that podcast and you get exactly what you want. And you're frustrated two years in because they don't buy anything from you because that happens a lot. And it happens way more than most influencers will, uh, will admit openly they'll talk to you about it behind the scenes they'll they'll whisper about it in the con the hallways outside the conference rooms but they don't talk about that on stage so yeah i think that anybody in the in the creative field i mean everybody's probably read by now you know the a thousand true fans and i think a lot of musicians nowadays especially and maybe even creative artists are kind of on board with that model the question is like how do you get there um that has not really creeped into business yet it's just now kind of starting to make some inroads that that thousand true fans mentality because mm -hmm. of what you talked about. There's so much pressure that if you're not on your way to being the next Tony Robbins, you are irrelevant. Um, I would like to see that completely smashed because I don't think it works. Well, and I think it's very interesting. I, I, I believe the reason why people are starting to have those conversations or even be transparent is because in the last chunk of time, obviously mm -hmm. it's been accelerated for people to be converting and creating and finding new ways. I mean, this has been a massive, you know, two to, two to three year creative time in, in the world of entrepreneurialism. And when you see what other people are doing, you tend to think that that's the blueprint. Yeah. So you don't have time to question it until you're sitting there with your accountant <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> how many hours am I putting in? You know, what's my ROI? Because you're so busy in the build, you just think that you're going to get there and you're going to get there and strategic planning and having conversations with your pot, you know, your accountant or, or whomever you, you do your books with or your CFO or what have you, until you start to have people feedback that information, I don't think people even, even had really time to question it because they haven't had time to experience it yet. And we talked about this yeah. earlier, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Do, do you know who Sam Ovens is? Started consulting.com. He has a big program. It's like a $2,000 package called Consulting Accelerator, which he just shut down apparently. So he was running his like an educational online course business. He grew that to 30 million a year. The problem was he was spending 10 million of it in ads to get that 30 million in sales. So he just closed down his beginner level program, the $2,000 program. He just cut off most of the ads and uh, said he streamlined the business down. They lost. 22 of that 30 million a year in revenue, they're still more profitable now than they were when they were running at full speed, 30 million a year revenue. So, so people are starting to figure it out, like, cause now people have kind of pushed that limit in some of these new business models that just came along within the last 10 or 15 years, things like selling courses online or things like that. And they've pushed it as far as they can go. Now ad costs are going up and they're looking at it going, man, do I want to, is it worth it? Is it worth it to give a third or a half of my income to Facebook just to get the big top line numbers that gets me on, on a stage to talk about it somewhere when I know I'm not actually making any more money on it. And they're all starting to pull back and go, maybe I should think about my <laughs> lifestyle uh, and, and put, put, some, uh, put my family first and maybe put some creative pursuits uh, back into my life and stuff. Uh, I think it just took a while when all these new business models for the internet kind of came along and exploded. Like people just went all in and went, oh my God, this is amazing. Let's do it. Let's push it, push it, push it. And now they're going, oh, okay maybe now we want to find the balance between lifestyle and creative pursuits and the business. So it doesn't take over our entire being and we're not giving half of our revenue to, uh, to Facebook. So interesting. And so timely, so timely, right. Um, talk about podcasts. This is, yeah. this is a, you know, we're on one. Um, they're sexy. They're attractive. Um, that's what people see. There's also all sides to, to podcasts and because they're sexy and their media and media is sexy and it's a hot topic and everything from social media and gosh knows, I feel like I've been in a social media school for three years. 
um, from someone yeah. who did business belly to belly. I mean, that's, that's more my generation, uh, yeah. right? I went yeah. from generation, you know, and um, so let's talk about podcasts a little bit because I get the question a lot. I would imagine you especially get podcast questions a lot because that's part of your work. Um, what do I do? Are they worth it? What does it take? All those questions, <laughs> right? Because man. Well, it's, it's hard for me to be impartial, but I do my, do my best because podcasting changed my life. Um, yeah. It took me from just being a random person that worked at some agency somewhere to all of a sudden being an influencer and essentially micro famous in my corner of the world in 18 months. It was 18 months from starting my podcast to doing a sold, like a sold out breakout session at a national event all the way at the end of the end of the country, uh, 18 months later. Um, that's what it can do for you. Um, it can make you micro famous in a certain space. If you position it well, if you target it well, if you're good at it, you know, not, never, not everybody's going to set the world on fire with their personality, but you know, if, if, if podcasting is a good medium where you like to have deep, interesting conversations with fascinating people and you know how to ask good questions and have good conversations. Yeah. You have a le legitimate chance of becoming a, a micro famous influential person in a certain space. Now, whether it goes beyond that point, that depends on the audience and it depends on how much you tap into the culture, the zeitgeist of what's happening in the world. You know, you look at somebody like a Joe Rogan and I can point out four specific waves in the culture that he rode. You've got stand-up comedy, reality TV, then UFC, then comedy podcasting, bam, 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 wave after wave after wave that he rode. And finally he ends up being the number one in that comedy podcast category. Next thing you know, that comedy podcast category, because of the cultural wave behind it, ends up being one of the, they're just one of the biggest categories of podcasting in general. So guess what? He ends up being, you know, the biggest podcaster on the planet. You know, one of my clients the other day asked, like, what's the difference? What's the difference between us out here in entrepreneur land and a Joe Rogan? I'm like, it's not execution. He, Joe Rogan and his team are not any better at executing podcasts than probably what you and I are doing right here, right? Mm -hmm. The difference is the culture. So if you can, if you can find something and you have a, an idea whose time has come, podcasting can propel that idea even further into the culture and help you build a huge, potentially a huge, huge, huge audience. And that's, what's cool about podcasting. It, you and I could be speaking to a hundred people, a thousand people, or a million people. It doesn't take any more effort. We didn't have to get on 50 more planes. <laughs> we didn't have to stay in 50 more hotel rooms. Uh, so the scalability is what's so attractive about it because you can have the same conversation to reach a million people for literally the same cost. And uh, yeah, so it's a really a matter of just what do you have to say? What mission are you on? And if you're on a mission that taps into something that people believe in, a podcast is so accessible, so shareable so easy to spread so easy for people to tell other people about through word of mouth that if they if they agree and they they latch on to your mission the show will grow 60 percent of podcast growth is word of mouth so it's just about getting people enrolled in your mission and if you do that your podcast absolutely will grow and the only question is just how much how how much can you enroll people in that mission it determines how much your podcast will grow and i get a question a lot and i I know because we are in the world of entrepreneurship where people do more than one thing. So, you know, you just talked that example very mm -hmm. much. So, and even with yourself, you know, mm -hmm. marketing, consulting, podcasting, you know, marketing agent by morning and musician by night. So, right. And people say, they ask me, they're like, how many podcasts should one person have? Um, should <laughs> I have more than one podcast? Yeah. You know, you've got, this audience and that audience? Should I build one audience as big as I can or should I diversify? Do you have an answer yeah. to that? Those are those are amazing questions. And yes, I I deal with those questions all the time and I have opinions, but honestly, I, I reserve the right to change my opinion five minutes from now. So here's, here's what I think right now. Uh, I think if you have something to sell, there is value in having at least one podcast where you do both networking and teaching all in one platform. In other words, you have a place where you have conversations and then on that same platform, you also just turn on the recording and speak directly to the audience because that's where they get to know you the best and that's where they're probably going to connect with you the best and actually buy what you have to sell. I would call those solo episodes. Now, I have, uh, I have also experimented with splitting those into two shows. 
Now I have an agency, so I can just tell my minions, hey, we're going to do this. And it's easy, right? If you don't have minions, it's a little harder to do that. But yeah, uh, if you have minions, that that's very easy to experiment with. So at one point, I split off into two shows, and I had a, a, a show that was nothing but conversations and a show that was nothing but teaching. I've done it. It works. That works too. Now, here's the deal if you're multi-passionate, because I think that's really what people are, that's the big struggle, right? Uh, I think that everything has to be branded in its own little silo. So if you go look for my music under Microfamous, you won't find it, right? Because nobody, like the business, this is not the same audience, right? It's not the same people. Um, if you go look for prayer prompts on YouTube, you'll find the music. I don't run a podcast for that. It is what it is, right? It's, it's on YouTube for a reason, because that's the place where it's music is most easy to share and discover. So I think that you have to silo everything. However, uh, it is possible in some cases to have a personal platform that's about you, that's about whatever your big mission is. And you can talk about the various projects that you have and the various things that each have their own little silo and they're each branded, but you can talk about them all in one central location. So it is possible, it's hard, it's hard. I think the secret is you've got to find maybe something that's a common thread mm -hmm. that runs through all of your different projects that you're involved in, or it just has to be personal. The Tony Robbins podcast. Nobody cares that it's not called something else because it's Tony Robbins and he can call the Tony Robbins podcast. Uh, so you can absolutely do something like that, right? You can just have it be about you and you are the person. If they connect with your personality, it works great. Um, so one of the things that I'm working on right now that kind of ties together a whole bunch of interests for me is the book is the podcast I'd like to have you on, which is called one book that changed my life. That gives me a place to have really awesome deep conversations about books and about people's lives and how they were affected by those books. Then I can also do solo episodes where I just talk about the books that I like. And I can just talk about stuff that interests me, right? So it gives me a place where I can talk about all that. And I can also drop references to Microfamous and the music and like all that stuff. It's like my platform to kind of do what I want with. But here's the secret to that, that the show is branded and it has it's built around one clear and compelling idea. It just so happens that when you show up for that, I know you're probably the kind of person that'll be interested in this other stuff that I can mention. So that's the that's the ideal is you find something that actually has a brand of its own. It's based around a single powerful idea that actually does cut through the noise. And then when it attracts those people, you're able to kind of send them off in various directions to the other projects that you're involved in based on how you talk about them. One of my clients would call that inline mentions. You just kind of casually go, oh, you know, when I wrote the micro famous book and you just kind of like drop the reference in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's the idea is you have that a separate brand that has its own personality, its own identity. It has the potential to build and spread. And then when people show up for that, you, you siphon them off into their own little silos to tell them, hey, go check this out, go check that out for your other projects. Hopefully that answers that question. It does. So I know, and you know, you can, you can, you know, put a disclaimer to this one as well, you know. Okay. You know, no, really. I would like that, like I reserve the right would to change you, my mind. Okay. Did we get that contract signed? Um, <laughs> so, right. We all have our own stories of entrepreneurs, how many years you've been in, you know, I've been, I can, I've been an entrepreneur for 30 years. But wow, it's just been so different in each, God, every part of that journey has been completely different because generationally things have changed. And so now we're in this wave yeah. of media. Now we're in this wave of, and people are like, what do I gauge myself? I mean, everyone wants to be, you know, Rogan. I was like, oh, I could have a podcast like, but can you, and is it worth it? Those are some of the questions that we're asking ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um and then there's the conversation that I had with a wonderful colleague that says, you know, there's a high ratio of people that start podcasts that don't complete them or don't get past their hundredth episode, because it really is, there's a certain amount of time and energy and dedication to this. Really, it's a form of marketing, right? Okay. It's a form of mar form of marketing. So where do you see, so people are starting to have this conversation around monetizing. They're like, oh, I can have a podcast that I monetize. So in terms of monetizing podcasts, that's a whole, I think that's a whole sector that people don't really know a whole lot about. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're going in that direction from a podcast standpoint? Oh. Uh, yes, about as quickly as a snail moves. Um, <laughs> yeah, a Apple seems to be wildly uninterested in helping us with that. They could mm -hmm. be making billions, uh, they could be building the world's best audio advertising platform. 
and they seem wildly uninterested in doing so. I don't know why. So no, here, here's where monetization is at. If you're in business, your best bet is promoting the things that you sell, as long as you're able to sell them online or you know nationally, okay. right? If you have a local okay. brick and mortar, whatever. Um, but yeah, for most of your audience, if, if, if you're selling, you know, if you're selling music or creative artworks, or if you're an entrepreneur or something like that, if you can sell your stuff to anybody in the country, your best bet is promoting what you have to sell and building your list. So you should always have two places to send people. One is to the main absolute top of the, you know, like, here's how you hire me. The second way should be just how do you get people into the list? Um, there's a whole section of the book where I dig into like the economics of sponsorships why it's so hard to build a, a sponsorship that works long-term because it's like, um, well, you have background in like the health and the health and fitness area and like the MLM space and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like think about mapping out what the splits are, right. Where <laughs> everybody gets the incentives just right. You're like, it's like you're, you're fiddling with about 50 different dials to keep everybody incentivized to do the right things. So people right. keep recruiting and some people buy and the company's incentivized and they don't go out of business because they pay too much and all this stuff, right? Like there's about 50 different dials. That's what, that's what podcast sponsorships are like. You're constantly fiddling with the dial to keep the sponsor happy, not overload your audience, keep you happy. So it's worth it to do it. Um, like I had a client that was making 1500 a month in sponsorships and like honest, uh, company was sponsoring her and like, but the, the sponsors rotate out every two or three months. She finally ditched it. It's like, it's not worth it. It's like not worth the time <laughs> just to record the new sponsor bits and stuff like that. It was, uh, right. it, it was more pain than it was worth. And she was making what most people would say is good money. It was more than offsetting the, uh, the cost of the podcast. And so it's, it's really hard to build win-win sponsorships right now. Now, if somebody like Apple came across the top and said, Hey, we got this. We'll insert all the ads. We'll give you a cut of the revenue. We take our cut. Everybody goes home happy. If they solve that problem, that could change the entire landscape. Well, we're going to see how that rolls out, but <laughs> <laughs> right. It'd be nice if they did that for us. So I'm going to kind of take us totally off conversation because I know we're yeah. kind of probably winding down and I want to take us off conversation a little bit. Um, tell a little bit more about you. So you've had a journey through entrepreneurship, you've clearly said yes. You've said yes more than a number of times. You help others do that. Um, you're pretty strong in your whole media presence. Surprise us. What what was what what's one of the biggest surprises or something very cool that happened to you that you just didn't see coming? Like, you know, my country is probably really glad listening to this that I didn't walk through the door. They're like, <laughs> you know, what is the is there something that just blew you away? Made it worth it. Oh man. I know um, it's a big one. Yeah. Okay. So here, here's a moment. Um, okay. on, on the first podcast I started, uh, we had a little bit of an inside joke running. I'm like, I'm, you know, I don't have any kids. I'm uh, semi single or whatever you want to call it. But we, we invent like my co-host on that show invented a fake wife and fake kids for me so that we could do sales role plays and stuff where he would treat like he would refer to my wife and kids. And eventually the kids became overweight, diabetic insulin. They required insulin and that they got that got bigger, like everything got bigger and more outrageous. So so it became this running joke on the show for years and years. And I was at a conference one time and I didn't even I wasn't even sure if I knew anybody at this particular one. And somebody came up to me and said, Matt how's Julie and the kids and just like <laughs> quoted the exact inside joke from the podcast. I'm like that, that is, that was a really cool moment. Uh, cause yeah, cause it's so far beyond just like showing up to an audience that wants to hear what you have to say. And yeah. it was meeting someone that felt like they knew you and you have no idea who this person is, but they feel like they have a personal relationship with you. Uh, you've done enough like radio and TV and, and media and all that stuff to know what that feels like. I'm sure it's mm -hmm. a really cool feeling. That was something mm -hmm. that I was really surprised by because I, I am an introvert. I tend to not want to be bothered when I'm out and about. I like to do my business. I want to have my earbuds in. Like I'm not a, so, a super social person when I'm out and about. That was a, that was a very cool, surprising thing. Wow. That's interesting. That's amazing. That's great. Oh my yeah. gosh. You could get a t-shirt picture, family picture on there. <laughs> my my co-host already has yeah. a picture picked out. It's, it's hilarious. Yes. That's Three amazing. very, very, very overweight kids. I think one of them is smoking. Oh. <laughs> Something like that. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> look, we're both in the world of helping entrepreneurs. I want people to, even though podcasts per se are not this place where we go into everything we do and what we offer, but look, 
we're on a show of entrepreneurs and creatives and, mm. you know, it's, you know, you drink this stuff for, you know, in the morning for coffee and everybody needs advice. Everybody needs someone to go to. People have said to me, Deb, you've done this for 30 years. How have you been successful? I said, I've either had a coach, a counselor, a therapist, and emotional intelligence, um, or, you know, to make that way. Like you go down this road, you get advice from somebody, you clearly have a lot of advice to offer. So go ahead, do some, do some shameless PR, please tell us what books you're talking about. Like there's, Ooh. what do you, what do you do? Like share a little bit because Matt, people well, need you. Okay. Well, I, I guess for the, let me do the shameless plug while I buy some time mentally to think about what else I would say. Uh, so go to getmicrofamous.com because that's where I write uh, and you can, you can check out the podcast service. There's a link there to grab a call with me and stuff like that. If you're, if you're in the entrepreneurial game, you have a mission, you want to reach people, you want to impact people. We do all the podcast production. It's hundred percent done for you. Uh, we do all the guest booking, social media promotion, audio video, the whole nine yards. So you just show up and record. Um, you know, the, the things that I'm reading about are man, like, uh, so, so I, I have a mentor, right. And you're mm -hmm. so right about that. Uh, I have a really, really close circle. And when I have somebody that says, Matt, you need this book. I'm, I'm literally on my phone ordering it on Amazon before they finish the sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the best things I could tell people. Like some, some, one of my clients said this is like an addendum to the famous saying is like the, you know, if you want to change your life, the difference is the mentors that you have, the books you read and the podcasts you listen to. You know, so like I, I'm reading stuff on finance, like the alchemy of finance, like George Soros book, like just I'm, I'm going at diving into history and and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's really it really does come down to the mentors that you have, the books you read. And then nowadays we have podcasts to listen to and that that can change your life. You'll be a different like I'm a different person now than even I was five years ago. And you'd think in my 30s, my personality would have been set. It was not set. Like entrepreneurship changed me and it made me a better human being. Uh, and if you get around ultra successful people, you realize a lot of them are actually not douchey. They're some of the nicest people in the world. I don't think people that are, that come from a low, like low class blue collar background, like I did, most of them don't realize that, but they're incredibly nice, incredibly generous. They're looking for people to mentor. Uh, the biggest, I would say the biggest mistake I ever made was not finding a mentor early on and discounting mm -hmm. that they would want to want to mentor somebody. Cause who am I? Uh, now I realize that was a huge mistake and they're looking for people to mentor. So find them because they're out there and they want to mentor people. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. That's fantastic advice. Um, so I think that we're going to wrap ourselves up here. I mm -hmm. have, I mean, I feel like I've learned so much about podcasting and I'm on one. Um, <laughs> look, I'm, I'm not going to do some shameless PR, but oh, what I am going to show I insist oh. upon it. Do you? Do you? I do. No. Come on. It's your own show. You got to do some shameless plugging on your own show. Shameless if you plug can't shameless plug on your own show, where are you going to do it? Right. Well, at least you're going to bring me on yours. No, I am. That I am going to share. And, and look, it's called Mission Accepted. I love and create platforms, whether it's in the books or whether it's the quotes in the planners or whether it's on you know, being endorsed on the website, whatever it is, there's a multitude, a plethora, I call it, because it sounds more like a bouquet, doesn't it? A plethora of platforms for in, for entrepreneurs, creatives to um, have exposure, you know, to really, I believe that we're all here for a reason. I was the happiest cocktail waitress ever because I was in service. Yes, I like music, but I like being in service. That's what I am. And I'm absolutely in service to entrepreneurs. It's what I am. It's what I do. I don't, you know, I don't put it on in the morning and take it off at night. It's kind of what makes me what they call a professional hippie. So I'm a gluten-free professional hippie. <laughs> and if you have something that you want to write in a book or come onto the podcast and share, then you're going to reach out to me and we're going to have a conversation and it's going to be wonderful. Um, I have as well lived my life by um, mentors and advisors. And probably when, when you said that, one of the things that um, probably if I was to say I, the mistake that I made was thinking that I was maybe too small to go ask somebody to take me to the next level. I felt like I had to stay in my, in my wheelhouse so I could go here, but I couldn't go here because for sure I couldn't afford to go there. For sure they had other people. I'm talking, you know, they're, they're, I'm like, oh, I'd love to talk to them, but I think I need to take these steps before I talk to them. 
And yep. you just proved it to point that's not true. I'm sure you and I both get phone calls from people that are like over the, you know, they're like, oh, thank you so much for taking my call. And I'm like, don't be ridiculous. Like, don't be ridiculous. Your time is as valuable as my time. I had a call like that mm. yesterday. She kept saying, thank you. And I'm like, stop it. <laughs> stop it. Right. I, you know, are, I am you, famously you unavailable, next, so I get that reaction. I'm not NASA. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> not, <laughs> not NASA. <laughs> not NASA. Right? So I'm like, you're cool. I'm cool. We're cool. And um, so I love working with people. Obviously, I only have time to work with not everybody, but I absolutely want to hear people that, you know, hear from people that want to, you know, I call it becoming number one in your company, even if you're the only one in your company. That's what right. I teach people to do. <laughs> um, any last words, Mr. Matt? Oh man, you got to put me on the spot like that. Really? I know. Uh, no, I have podcaster. no last words. I think that's a great way to end it. Becoming the number one in your company, even if you're the only one, because it speaks to whether you're a creative or an entrepreneur, you have to approach it the same way. Some, uh, who said this, I was listening to maybe it was a football commentator. Yeah. It was, it was a guy that washed out. He was a huge draft bust. And he said, when I go and speak in, into athletes that have just been drafted, they're about to come into a huge amount of money. And he's like, most of them come from very poor backgrounds. It's like, I tell them, you are now the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Act like it. And that's, I think, for any entrepreneur, that's good advice. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed our conversation immensely, and I'm sure so did everybody else. I can't wait to come on to, <laughs> now I'm a little, I'm a little scared. I, I threw a couple of questions at you and threw you up. I'm like, Ooh, what is he, he going to ask me? I'm going to have to go back and read that book that changed my life, which when, as soon as you asked, said that to me before I knew exactly what that was. And I think we all do. I know exactly. Wait. Okay. Yeah, lay, lay it on I, me. You got to tease it a little bit. Okay. Well, here I was, I was on a bus with me and my buses, right? I was on a bus. And I was coming home from one of my first jobs, which was the receptionist in a car dealership. And I had this book and I don't know why, and I don't know how I got this book, but, I, and it was completely out of the wheelhouse of anything. Okay. I come from the music industry, you know, a number of years ago, not necessarily a holistic. Somehow I got the book Shakti Gaiwan living in the light. Okay. And I started reading this book and it was like, I was, I was sitting in the back seat of the bus and everything kind of almost the word that comes to me is melted. It was like everything I knew to be true that no one ever told me I was reading about. It was incredible. It was actually talking about female energy and masculine energy. I was in my twenties. No one talked like that then. Um, and it was about, um, being okay for me. I think it was important being okay, being someone with all these ideas and really wanting to execute them. Cause that was more of a masculine thing, right? I was a receptionist. I can tell you in school, I was given four choices. Did you want to be a nurse, a secretary, secretary, airline stewardess, or a teacher? Like that's literally how we were talked to. And the only reason I picked stewardess is because, because it was, it, it had some sense of freedom, right? right. <laughs> like, you know? Um, so it was the first book that kind of unlocked that there was something about this creative energy that I had. And there was a place for it. And someone actually wrote about it. Honestly, probably it was a magical moment for me that changed everything. And from that book on made me feel like it was okay to say yes. Interesting. Well, I'm excited mm -hmm. to dig into that deeper and see what else still mm -hmm. stands out years later and like what, what the path was, what immediate changes you made and all that stuff. Yeah. That'd be yeah. a fun conversation. I love it. Yeah. It reminds me of when Brene Brown says that when she read, you know, the man in the arena speech how her husband said she became dangerous. <laughs> and for me, I think that's what that book did is it made me, made me get dangerous. It was like, <laughs> yes, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can do this. I My family's that. like, oh God. Okay. Another conversation again. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Deb. I appreciate it. Welcome. And you know what, you guys, we will see you again next week with an incredible, incredible person that is going to sit just where Matt is sitting today and telling stories that you can relate to and be inspired. And please share this. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for being visitors or listeners, visitors, listeners, visitor and listener at the same time, audio and visual. <laughs> we'll, call, we'll call it a visitor. A visitor. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.